Okay. Well, Claire, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm so excited about this conversation. Oh, yay. Well, listen, we were introduced by Casey Davidson. She was like, oh, you have to interview Claire. She's amazing. And I was like, oh, of course I have to interview Claire at the Sober Diaries. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's so kind of you. Thank you. I hope I live up to the billing. <laughs> <laughs> you're adorable. So you're located in London. Is that right? Yes, that, that's where I am right now. And we're actually right in the middle of, of another lockdown and uh, hopefully coming out of it soon. But uh, yeah, it's been it's been a difficult year in London. Oh, my goodness. Another lockdown. Yeah, I, I'm out here in uh, Idaho in the States and we're, we're pretty much wide open. But uh, life does not feel normal yet. And I'm starting to wonder if <laughs> we'll ever get there. Mm. Hopefully one day. We I've had my vaccination though, which is uh, which is very exciting. So there is light at the other end of the tunnel. Oh, that's great. I'm ha- I'm happy to hear. Did you get the two part? Is it a two uh, part? Yes, so I've I've had the first part, and okay. uh, I get the second one in in a couple of months. Oh, a couple months. Okay. Mm. Yeah, my mother got it. She her two shots were three weeks apart. Mm. So yeah, she's, she's yeah. So. <laughs> The things that we have to deal with now, it's kind of crazy. How are the kids doing? Are they adjusting? Uh, yeah, they had a long time off school. So uh, so for quite a long time, there were five of us in the house the whole time. So my husband, my three kids, myself, two dogs, and you know, trying to find anywhere to get any work done um, without constantly being interrupted by somebody wanting something to eat or something, some help with their schoolwork or you know, a, a conversation or something, you know, was was almost impossible. So it was crazy. And you know, like so many mums around the world, you know, I was just spending the whole time cooking and cleaning and doing washing and trying to do my job as well and it was yeah it's it's been it's been challenging for all of us but uh, so but the schools are open again now which is a uh, which is a big bonus <laughs> yay oh well that's that's a relief for everybody I'm sure the kids were anxious to get back yeah yeah they're really pleased to be back so isn't that so, funny like last. typically kids don't want to go to school and now they're just like let me go to school yeah I mean I guess on the upside it's it's you know I, I'm not sure we'll ever take some of the things for granted again that that we used to. You know, I mean, I will always be grateful that the kids have sc- a school to go to. You know? Yeah, for sure. And I think they will be too. You know, and they really appreciate their friends more. They, you know, they appreciate the sort of, you know, I think we all appreciate the simple things a lot more than we did. You know, so it's so interesting because for those of us who are in recovery, you know. alcoholism and and addiction are diseases of isolation, right? And connection is the cure. So for us to be isolated is very challenging and to have all those added responsibilities, lack of connection with outside people and just not being able to take a break from the family occasion. um, You know, we have to get creative. But you you know, I mean, I, I guess I'm sure you do as well. You know, I felt uh, grateful every single day during this pandemic that I wasn't drinking because you know if I had been as you say you know without that connection with you know just being at home the whole time with all those stresses and strains and you know all that anxiety you know I would have thrown out all the staples from my cupboards and filled them with <laughs> with with alcohol and I would have been you know all the wheels would have fallen off um, my life I think if I'd still been drinking so you know I'm so grateful that I I you know I quit before this all happened yeah absolutely Um, yeah, and I definitely want to ask you about your story. I typically like to start with something I've been calling the lightning round, which is I'll just ask you a a few kind of fun questions as a little icebreaker, and then we'll, we'll get into your story. And I'm anxious to talk about the, um, the, the sober diaries and your new book, the authenticity project, which I've been listening to on audible and I'm obsessed. I haven't finished it and I'm dying to ask you questions about it, but you probably won't tell me the ending, will you? (laughs) (laughs) you. (laughs) No, no, I haven't met Riley or Alice yet. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. (laughs) You met Hazard though. Oh yeah. Yeah. What a perfect name for him. Hazard. He sounds 
super handsome and charming and uh, t- t- his name fits him perfectly he is yeah in my head train wreck. he looks like um bradley cooper <laughs> yes i can tell we'll be best friends forever <laughs> <laughs> did you see a star is born yeah of yeah, course exactly. you did. and actually i saw that after i'd written the book and oh, really? i was watching that thinking oh my god that's hazard <laughs> so, wow. yeah yeah that's oh my goodness well, do you think this would ever be made into a movie? Well, I have sold the rights, actually. So fingers oh. crossed. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. They could make the. I hope oh my so. Gosh. I can't wait. Okay. Before I get too lost in my own personal <laughs> <laughs> agenda. Um, okay. So the lightning round, do you have a, listen, you wrote, you wrote an amazing book, but before you got sober, were you reading other books? Did you have a favorite recovery book? uh oh I read so many um I think one of my favorite my favorites was um Drinking a Love Story by Caroline Knapp which isn't so much a recovery book it's more a book about addiction but it's just so beautifully written and um you know I just found myself nodding along to so many things she said I mean she just expressed for me what it what it was like to be you know a woman addicted to alcohol um so you know I absolutely love that book and then I read um I read a book uh, by Jason Vale called Kick the Drink Easily and um I love that because it just challenged the way I looked at alcohol and it um it made me um it made me realize that um that the thing I thought was my best friend was actually my worst enemy it just changed my mindset um and so that that was you know I was really grateful for that is interesting your friend is your enemy I use I always say when in my you know when I tell my stories you know it's the thing it was like my savior turned into my executioner like it was yeah yeah exactly exactly yeah, it was, it was killing me. And, you know, since I've gotten sober, I've seen plenty of people not survive. Right. So not to be overly dramatic, but that's, mm. how, that's how it was for me. Um, okay. I'm going to have to check that book out by Jason Vale. I've never heard of that one, but uh, did you, after that, kick the drink easily? <laughs> Uh, well, it's, ne- it's never, never as easy as, as you hope it's going to be. Um, it, uh, uh, you know, I, it, takes a hell of a lot longer than you think it's going to I mean I remember when I like I stopped drinking and I thought you know okay this is going to feel awful for a few weeks and then you know I'll be I'll be fine and you know it's a it's a two-year process really it's it's not a it's not a quick thing but you know it's an extraordinary process and and it's you know it's one that is so uh it's so transformational in so many ways you know I I knew that not drinking would change my life but I didn't realize it would change all of it you know every aspect of it in some way shape or form yeah in a deeper like four-dimensional kind of way Mm. you sort of you sort of end up having to take yourself to pieces and then put yourself back together again and you know in putting yourself back together again you end up a different person um so yeah, it's, it's, it is quite a process. You know, did you find that you're a different person or did you feel like you returned to the person you once, like your best self, like you, what you once were, or maybe even a better version? Um, that's a really interesting question, actually, because something that I, I talk of mentioning at the Sober Diaries is actually I, uh, at one point, I, you know, um, that year, that first year I quit drinking, I read so much stuff and and somebody that I got really interested in was uh Wayne Dyer Mm. um and you know who talks about um manifestation and um you know he's he's a really interesting guy and um and he doesn't drink um didn't drink he's he sadly died quite relatively recently um but he talks about how when you quit drinking you find that you go um travel in sort of a great circle and end up right back where you started (laughs) and that is actually exactly what happened to me you know I sort of felt like I'd gone on this really long journey and I'd ended up back where I was as a teenager um in that 
you know, I've just rediscovered the person I used to be. Um, and, you know, which was quite fascinating because I'd sort of lost her along the way, you know. So yeah. I rediscovered my childhood passions, um, with, so reading and writing. And, you know, I became the person that as a child I really wanted to be. Um, you know, I ended up as a novelist, which is what I wanted to be when I was a little girl. And, you know, and when I was younger, I was sort of, you know, fearless and passionate and I became that person again you know and I'd lost all of those things and I hadn't even realized I'd lost them until I refound them so so yeah so it is for me it was almost like going around in a giant circle to end up <laughs> back at the beginning <laughs> but in a good way but yeah but the the version of yourself that you were always meant to be yeah yeah I hope so yeah absolutely um, do you happen to have a favorite mantra or quote that guides your life? Um, yeah, I do actually. And um, it's uh, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, which is the title of a book by uh, Susan Jeffers. Um, and I find that that really helpful because I realized when I quit drinking that a lot of becoming sober is about learning to deal with fear. Um, fear and anxiety and for years every time I felt the slightest bit worried about something or nervous about something or anxious about something I'd have a drink and numb that feeling away and in doing that I never confronted those fears and therefore I became more and more and more cautious about everything and scared of everything and actually you know what I realized is is when you learn to confront your fears um, amazing things can happen and actually well, there's a great quote by Will Smith um, and he says um, on the other side of your maximum fear lie all the best things in life and for me that's been so true and you and I were talking about this earlier actually saying that those you know those things that you're scared of is almost like a little warning that your life is about to transform in some way and that can be a really good thing it's fear is not necessarily a bad thing it, it can be a sign of something really good about to happen yeah, I like to think of those fears as sort of like growing pains like there, there's yeah there's growing pains like the discomfort is either growing pains or it's a sign that that something needs attention or adjustment not to check out Right. That's, yeah, that, and if, if is... you avoid fear, you never grow. Um, you know, you're quite right. And there's actually there's something we talked about. Um, Caroline Knapp's book, A Drinking Story, and she talks about how um, addicts um, tend to uh, stop growing. They stop growing up right. um, because because you stop, you know, dealing with emotions. You stop learning. You stop learning how to deal with anything. And you know, as a result, if you sort of became a, an addict in your mid twenties, your emotional state is sort of stuck at the age of. There we go. There we go. I, don't, I don't know what. Sorry, I don't know whether this is because I'm on my iPad rather than my it's laptop. Fine. It never normally happens. So no, no, it's <laughs> fine. I'm sorry if it's my end. No worries. I had you at um, we're, when we stopped drinking. We're stuck at the age that we started. Do you want to say that again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, did did we get the bit about Caroline Knapp? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, so yes, I I think when you know I stopped I um you know started oh, sorry start again um so you know when uh, you know when you start um, drinking you stop growing and I think I stopped growing at about the age of twenty five and uh, you know it wasn't until I quit drinking again you know many years later that um that you know I started uh, I started growing again yeah I've heard that as well um and, and I think I I can see the validity in that because uh it, and it's so interesting when we first first get into recovery it's like we have to recover our whole selves right like the good and the bad and we have to reconcile lots of parts of our personality and and it's um, so helpful to have like a program or a process to help with that piece, to help us kind of catch mm. up. Um, that's really good. I love that idea about uh, facing the fear and doing it anyway. Do you know, I read that book. That was one of the books I read 
uh, before I got sober, I went through a two year period where I knew my drinking, I was questioning my drinking and I thought I could think my way into right living. So I was basically living in the self-help section at Barnes and Noble and I was reading <laughs> all these books. And that was one of the books I read. I thought that I was being, I was paralyzed by my fears and, you know, she was just like, feel the fear and do it anyway. And yeah, she's it's just funny, isn't it? How we, we try and, you know, we're so desperate not to stop drinking that we try and find any sort of, you know, other avenue. <laughs> so we, drinking, that you know, and, I, and I did the same. And I look at all the sort of, you know, all the things I tried to make myself feel mentally and physically better when I was ignoring the great big uh, <laughs> elephant in the room. You know? What types of things did you try? Oh, you know, over the years, I just sort of, you know, all this mindfulness stuff and yoga and, you know, all the, yeah, so um, uh, endless diets and, uh, yeah, you name it. And, um, you know, and it was actually so many of the problems I had were solved by not drinking. (laughs) Right. It's amazing how in denial we can be about that. Yeah. Um, Do you have a regular self-care practice in your recovery do you have like a a daily morning routine or do you have sort of a weekly process what does your recovery Um, routine look like uh you know what my the main thing that that I got in the habit of doing which actually then turned into my whole new career was writing so from the, Mm. the minute I stopped drinking I had this urge to write and to sort of just it was my way of understanding what was going on in my head and also my way of understanding all the stuff that I was reading and learning and you know talking about online to people and you know so I started I guess journaling but I did it in a blog so I started a blog called mummy was a secret drinker and every morning I would get up and write and um, so I start my day and actually the other thing I did um, right from the beginning was I switched my daylight hours so um, you know what I used to do was when I was drinking was go to bed quite late and I'd get up you know as late as I I could um, and um, and now I go to bed you know pretty early and I get up at 5 a.m and and I write first thing in the morning um, because what I learned was actually, you know, when you first quit drinking, the evenings are the hardest time and the, um, and the mornings mm-hmm. are the best time, you know, the mornings without a hangover are just fabulous. So, um, so actually switching your day around so you have less evening and more morning <laughs> is, a, is a really helpful thing to do. That is the truth. Which are, well, this, it seems like it's these so interesting, these simple little tweaks that we do mm. can make all the difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. That evening and, witching know, hour, that evening witching hour, that's that's a real thing. Yeah. So so making it shorter, you know, as soon as as soon as I got the kids in bed, you know, I would go to bed myself with a book, a hot chocolate, and you know, I would I would just sort of and you know, an iPad with a good Netflix you know, box set on it. And, and that was, that was me sorted. You know? That sounds lovely, to be honest, a little <laughs> cup of hot cocoa and a movie. Yeah. Um, what's the, uh, what's the one thing you wish you knew when you first got sober? Oh, um, oh, it's a really good question, actually. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure I have an answer. What's the one thing I wish I'd known um, oh, I guess I, I found this out fairly quickly, but I really wish I'd known right from the beginning that I wasn't alone mm. <laughs> because because actually right at the beginning, I felt like the only person in the world who had this problem and I was really ashamed and um, I didn't have anyone I didn't talk to anyone about it. And that's, you know, the other reason I started blogging because, you know, I found a community online because I was too ashamed to find a community in real life. Um, So, yeah, so I wish I'd known I wasn't alone. And, um, you know, and as soon as I found out, as soon as I found my own connections, my own community, everything got much easier. Definitely. That's, do you know, I've, several people have said that it feels like the loneliness is a Mm. feeling that is so intense for people with drinking issues. Yeah. And I think, I hope it's becoming easier for people now because 
you know, I think there is a lot, the, the sober community is a lot more vocal than it used to be. Um, right. You know, when I, I first quit drinking six years ago now, and, um, you know, I feel like back then it was all anonymous and, you know, um, Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know encourage that through this just their name you know it was all about no, right. you know, if you're if you, if you have an alcohol problem you stay really quiet about it and you don't talk about it whereas now you know there are more and more people going yeah I'm sober and I'm proud you know and right. and you know this is a great way of living your life and there is absolutely no reason why you should be anonymous and you know um Instagram is is a great example of that you know there are um, more and more people on on Instagram, you know, setting up pages where they are, you know, this is me, this is, you know, I don't drink, I'm proud of it, this is my life, this is, you know, and that didn't exist back then. So, so I hope nobody now feels alone the, the way that, that I did then, um, because you really don't need to. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to feel alone, we don't need, need to feel ashamed, this is not a, I, I learned I, I, it took me a while to learn that it was not a moral issue, right? It was just, mm. a phys, it was just a physiological issue that some people don't process alcohol the way other people do. Right. And it didn't yeah. make you a bad person. Like I did, I did bad things like, you know, quote air quotes on a podcast, bad yeah. things, but I was doing things outside my value system because my brain was not operating correctly. Cause I put a bunch of booze on it. So that was problematic for sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think I think the issue is the way that we don't as a society see alcohol as a drug. So, you know, <laughs> so if crazy. somebody gets addicted to cigarettes, you blame the nicotine. You don't say, "Oh, you've got such a problem, you know, you became addicted." <laughs> You're a horrible person. <laughs> uh, so, whereas you become addicted to alcohol and they blame you because nobody wants to blame alcohol because alcohol is a nation's favorite drug and, you know, they don't yeah, they, they don't want to think that there's something wrong with it. So I'm just finding my charger. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's not, um, it does mean that, you know, as, as an addict, you end up feeling like, you know, you're the one to blame, but it's, it's not right. us. It's, it's the toxin. It's, it's, it's yeah. the alcohol yeah. we should be blaming. Yeah. I definitely impersonalize the, the addiction about in the alcoholism. I don't even like to use the word alcoholism anymore. No, I don't actually. I talk about alcohol addiction um, instead because, uh, you know, I feel like it's, again, it's, we don't talk about, you know, we don't call somebody a nicotineaholic or, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, sugaraholic. It's, 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 or even a cocaine addict, you know I mean you're a cocaine addict or an alcohol addict or a sugar addict it's all the same sort of it's all the same physiology for the same you know right. same issues same reason yeah it all it all serves the same purpose which is to distract us from our our pain it's it becomes our coping mechanism mm. and it's so funny because even in religious texts you know they talk about Jesus turning water into wine so shoot if Jesus is on board then why not <laughs> Like Jesus said it was okay, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it's the only thing that, that we have to explain why we're not using it. The only drug we have to explain why we don't use mm, it. That's crazy. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, oh, my last question, something we never talk about. What do you do for fun? Which oh, is kind of um, hard in a, it's hard in well, a lockdown. At the but... moment, it's quite difficult to do it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. What about pre-COVID? What did you do for fun pre-COVID? So usually, I mean, my, the things I'm really missing, actually, are I miss travel. I love mm. travel. Um, and, you know, I just can't wait to be able to travel again. Me um, too. I really miss the theatre um, and, uh, um, and the cinema. Um, so... And art galleries, you know, it's all that sort of, you know, I, I feel I feel like a sort of sense of sensory deprivation. You know? Seriously. So um, it's funny, actually, you know, I used to think that alcohol was the only way you could sort of get out of your head. And, you know, and since I quit drinking, I realised that, you know, things like, um, a, you know, great music, you know, going to see a great band in concert or, um, you know, a, a, a grand theatre, cinema, um, art, you know, there's all really good ways of getting out of your head that are, are much healthier. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, I teach a class called Sobriety Reset. And one of the modules is how to have fun in sobriety. And I think what's 
not talked about a lot early in recovery is that our dopamine reward system is so skewed that it takes a little while for it to reset. So I have this huge list of like all kinds of activities that people can start experimenting with. You know, if like we tried one new thing a week, you know, to see what our new sober self enjoys, Mm. like often we don't even know what we like anymore because we've been so focused on alcohol that we don't even really know yeah, what we like anymore exactly we, I think as, and again as a society we are very lazy but about <laughs> you know the ways that we find socialize it's like oh well you know if you want to go out and socialize it has to involve going somewhere to have a drink you know whereas actually you know I find that you know one of the ways that I, I socialize most frequently now is is going for walks you know I go for long walks with girlfriends and we just talk for an hour and a half you know non-stop and you know in the old days where all my socializing happened at drinks parties you know I would see people and have those those little 10 minute conversations that didn't mean anything or get to any any depth or you know anything of interest it was all just sort of you know gossip and and what was happening on the sort of you know the latest tv show or whatever it might be and you know it's um you find you find different ways of connecting with people that are actually, again, much, much more interesting and much healthier in many ways. Yeah. Don't you find that since you've been sober, I don't know about you, like I'm almost incapable of small talk, (laughs) especially (laughs) in the beginning. It's like, I want to know what's really going on. (laughs) What's what's learning you these days? (laughs) I heard this, I heard this phrase one time it was, um, what's learning you, you know, what is going on in your life that's teaching you lessons about who you are? I always thought that was an interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. What's what's helping you evolve these days? Yeah. Well, um, that was it for the lightning round. Thanks for playing along. I learned a lot about you already. Um, I'm just curious about maybe you can recap your, your drinking experience. I I know you have it all in the sober diaries. I think it's so interesting. A lot of people I've heard since I've been sober talk about, you know, they want to write about their experience and they want to do it anonymously. And that's how you started your blog originally. Mm. When did you decide I'm asking you too many questions all at once. I just realized, how about you tell me your story and then I'll ask you about your blog. (laughs) Uh, So I mean, I, I think you know, when I first quit drinking, as I said, I, I felt very alone. I thought I was the only person that was experiencing what I was experiencing. And now I realize how common it is. Because yeah. actually my story is is very like the stories of so many people. You know, I, I can't tell you how many how many emails I've had over the last three years since the Sober Diaries was, was published with people saying, you know, you've written my story. You could be writing about me. And um, you know, so so my story is not very unique or very dramatic. It was just, you know, I was a mum with three young kids and, um, you know, I'd had a really full on job in advertising. So I was working hard, playing hard, um, you know, burning the candle at both ends um, and, you know, trying to bring up children. And by the time my third child was born, I was really burnt out. So I quit work thinking that I would spend a few years just trying to do one thing properly rather than everything badly. And, um, and I thought that, that if I took that stress out of my life, that I would actually find myself drinking less. And actually the drinking just escalated. And I found that, you know, by the time I got the kids in bed, I was, you know, I was exhausted. I was, you know, I was missing adult time. I was, you know, I needed to find some way of making the distinction from daytime to evening and some way of, you know, helping my shoulders to relax. And alcohol was just such an easy way of doing that. So, you know, I would pour a large glass of wine and that was, you know, that was, that was my reward, Um, you know, wine o'clock. And that, you know, you know how this works you know one glass of wine turns into two glasses of wine and that turns into three glasses of wine and if your wine glasses are big enough that's a whole bottle and you know by the time I was in my mid-40s I was drinking a bottle of wine every day and two bottles at weekends if I was going out so I was drinking about 10 bottles of wine a week Um, and 
You know, I didn't, it took me a long time to realize I had a problem because I thought everyone was drinking the way that I was or, or most of my friends I thought were drinking the way I was. And, um, and nobody told me that I should quit because I was, I, ne I was very rarely, you know, drunk. I was very rarely obviously drunk because I had built up my tolerance so gradually over the years that I could drink a bottle of wine over the course of an evening without it really seeming to have much effect, which is quite scary when you think about it. But of course it was having an effect because it was really messing with my mental health. It was messing with my physical health. I couldn't sleep. Um, I was anxious all the time. I was uh, overweight. I was, um, uh, you know, I, I was, I was grouchy. I wasn't being a good mum. I mean, you name it. I mean, you, you know, you know how it works. Um, and uh, and then I tried for the years not to quit I tried to cut down I tried to drink sensibly and moderately for a long time and I tried everything I tried all those rules that we've all set ourselves you know I'm not going to drink during the week I'm not going to drink at home I'm not going to you know all those sort of um you know ways we try and keep a lid on things and none of them worked for, for longer than a couple of weeks I'd be back right back to where I started um so finally I realized that it was all going to have to stop was there one moment like you know sometimes people say they have like a moment of clarity and they're like I, this has to stop like I can't possibly yeah. do this anymore. yes there was there was absolutely and actually it's the first page of, of of my book the sober diaries um because that moment was it was the morning after my birthday party it was my 46th birthday party and I woke up the following morning with a massive hangover obviously <laughs> and um, and I went down to the kitchen and it was about 11 o'clock in the morning and the kids were making a real racket, um, just doing normal kids stuff, you know. And but I had this terrible headache and I knew that the only thing that would stop my head throbbing was um, was alcohol, you know, hair of the dog. And, you know, but one of my hard and fast rules was um, no drinking before midday. And I thought that only um alcoholics drank before midday and if i if i didn't drink before midday then i was okay um and um so uh so what i did was because i knew this was wrong and because i didn't want the kids to see i got a mug out of the cupboard and i poured a tiny bit of red wine into this mug and i drank it and and I did feel better, but then I looked at the mug and the mug said the world's best mum on it. And that was the last drink I ever had. Wow. Did you know it was the last drink? Were you just like, I'm never doing this again? Yeah. Yeah. And I felt like I just, you know, I crossed a line, you know, at that point. And, um, you know, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to see what happened when on the other side of that line. Is relapse part of your story? Uh, well, it is in the past in that I gave up, I tried to give up a number of times before that moment and mm. made it, a, you know, a few weeks, a few months, a sort of, you know, I, uh, and then I convinced myself that actually I'd reset the dial and that I was going to be different and I was wiser <laughs> and I was, uh, you know, and within a few weeks, I'll be back to where I started again. So, so yes, it is, but not since that, that you know, seminal moment. So, so yeah, I haven't had a drink in six years. That's amazing. And I mean, listen, we've all, I had that experience too, where I wanted to stop and then I couldn't. And it was like, I would just find myself drinking and I'd be like, how, mm. how am I here again? Right. Like, like what you were saying, it's like, how am I in this place again? And that self-loathing and self-hatred that comes with it is just unbearable yeah yeah and and you feel sort of yeah as you say it's, it's you just lose respect for yourself and I think one of the one of the great things about about being sober is is rediscovering your self-respect um and you know that's a great that's a great feeling that really is um okay so that so that was it you had your last drink and then you started writing the blog 
Yeah, I mean, almost immediately. I mean, it's funny because I'd always, you know, as a child, I'd always, I'd always um, written stories and I, I spent my whole time reading and, you know, but I, I stopped writing for, for years apart from, you know, emails and, and PowerPoint presentations and that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, I, I, you know, within a couple of days of, you know, quitting drinking, I thought actually what I really need to do is write. I need to write about this. And, uh, and yeah, so I, I, and I felt that I was going to, I was going to write a diary, which is what I'd done as a child. But then I thought, well, you know, look, this is the 21st century. I should be writing a blog. So yeah, so I, I started blogging. How did people find your blog in the beginning? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't publicize it at all because I was blogging anonymously. I was using a pseudonym. Um, and uh, so I didn't put it out on social media. I didn't publicize it. But I think, you know, again, at that time, there were, you know, because there was still so much shame around, I think people, you know, people who were finding problems with alcohol would just as I'd done just google you know how do I quit drinking how do I you know mm. um, am I an alcoholic what does sort of you know uh, all these sorts of questions and those you know over time those questions would lead people to my blog so you know so yeah so people found me and um, I'm not sure I'm not sure it'd be the same if I was doing if you know if I was to do the same thing again now I'm not sure if it would have worked like that it's just uh, it was just that particular point in time I think yeah no I mean I just think it's amazing and beautiful that it grew organically and, and turned into something so amazing how much longer after the you were writing the blog did you publish the sober diaries um well it was a, after I've been writing for about a year um I started having more and more people say um uh you know this you really should turn this into a book because it would help more people and um and so I started I started sort of approaching um agents um literary agents uh, about a year after I started blogging and then I the book was published let me think uh, a couple of years after that so a uh, of years so yeah that took yeah. some persistence you, um, were you, well, were you just of, I'm so sorry go ahead no, I got the publishing deal relatively quickly. So about six months, um, it took me to 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 you know find an agent and a publishing deal. But then it took another year to write the book, edit the book, and you know and all that sort of you know. It's a publishing is is a pretty slow process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> well, what a blessing because it gave you time to adjust because then you were you were outed, you outed yourself. Like it went, how did it feel to like publish the book and have your name on it? Um, you know, I thought it was, I, I thought it would be fine until <laughs> about three nights before the book was, was sort of due to come out. And, you know, my publishers had lined up so much publicity. I was going to be on national TV and radio oh and God. in the national press and everything under my real name. And I thought, oh my God, I'm doing, all this publicity about the thing I'm most ashamed of in my whole life and what, why am I doing this um, and all these people that I've met over the years who you know I haven't seen for a long time are going to sort of see me washing my dirty laundry in public and you know um, and I didn't sleep for, for about three nights before the book came out and I have this I had this strange recurring dream I don't know if you've ever had this dream where you find that you're walking down a street naked naked um, staring at you I had that dream because that's what it felt like it felt yeah. like I was going to be walking down a street naked um so it was terrifying but um actually it was the most amazing thing because I realized that actually Brené Brown is really interesting on on this the power of vulnerability you know I realized that when you make yourself vulnerable um people are generally really kind you know and mm -hmm it's hard for people to criticize you when you're your own worst critic, you know, cause I'd already said, you know, I was a bad mother. I was an addict. I, you know, I did all these things wrong. Uh, so, you know, nobody could, could really level those things at me cause I'd already leveled them at myself. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. There is power and vulnerability. I mean, it's the, it's the honest truth, right? People can't, there's nothing to poke holes in when you've already, 
said the truth and mm. that vulnerability carries a bit of surrender. And you know, I think people, especially women respond to vulnerability with compassion and kindness. And it's Brene Brown who talks about that empathy is the antidote to shame. Yeah, you know, exactly. I love her. Exactly. She She's is brilliant. brilliant. Have, has mm -hmm. she interviewed you yet? No, no. You know she has a podcast. No, no, we need to get you on there. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. And listen, so so you didn't do any of their sort you didn't get sober in sort of a traditional 12 step type of way. Uh no, I didn't actually. I was um you know, I was, I think I was actually just too scared to do the whole AA thing. I was too worried about bumping into somebody I knew. I was, <laughs> and, you know, so I was, I also, I, I didn't, I didn't like all the terminology. I mean, we talked to talked about this a bit right. already, but I didn't like the idea of sort of defining myself the rest of my life by a negative, you know, and I thought, actually, you know, I am, I am more than, you know, just my addiction and, right. um, you know, so, so, so I didn't. Um, and, uh, but funny enough, actually, it's something I write about at the end of the book is the fact that I have, um, I have a friend who's a, um, a counsellor, um, uh, addiction counsellor, and she has done the 12 steps herself, and she coaches everybody else in 12 steps. And she read my book and she said, you know, you really did do the 12 steps, you know, you might not have done it formally, but the process you went through was, exactly the same you know this uh, surrender and you know the analysis and you know and even you know at the end all the giving back you know it is exactly the same process it's just you know I haven't formalized it in the same way yeah I I, <clears throat> I myself got sober through the 12 steps and it's been a beautiful magical process for me I was so so self-centered but incapable of self-examination when I showed up and so I actually needed a process and, mm -hmm. and like an objective third party to sort of help me sort out the stuff. Cause I was so confused about everything. So, and, and when I got sober, you know, uh, like 29 years ago, when I first started contemplating, there wasn't anything else besides that. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, um, I'm so glad that people now have sort of, we can shortcut the process for people, right? Like this book is serving a purpose in my mind of like, there's this idea that we're like pulling people out of the river, but at some point we need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. Right. Mm -hmm. And so this book, it totally lays out, you know, what to expect in the beginning, what the, what, I mean, your explanation of how you felt during that time is the thing that people, like you were saying, people go, oh yeah, that's my story. And so we don't, it heals that gap. It fills that gap that we're not alone. Yeah. And you know, when I first quit, I found so many, um, I read so many memoirs and they were, uh, they generally concentrated on the drinking years and <laughs> it would be all about the things that, you know, uh, you know, becoming an addict and, and what it felt like and all the terrible things that happened. And then at the end they would say, and then I got sober and everything is fine. <laughs> and you know, I was there thinking, well, how did you do it? And how yeah. long did it take to feel fine? And you know, and um, was it easy straight away or did it, you know, I mean, oh, I had so many questions that I didn't have the answers to. So I guess I wanted to write a book that looked at what happened next, you know, so what, what happens next? after the addiction, not, you know, during the addiction. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That, that initial period, like we talked earlier about socializing, like those experience, those first experiences, trying to socialize when you're not drinking and everybody else is, it's important to know how to handle those situations, like having an exit strategy, mm. having somebody go with you who knows you're not drinking, who can run interference if somebody's being too pushy, trying to push drinks on you. Or as soon as you get there, you grab a non-alcoholic drink. So nobody offers you anything like giving yourself permission to, to leave. If you feel uncomfortable, it's like, there are so many things about those social situations that we don't yeah have a clue. And, and just knowing things like um you know it's a roller coaster you know it, it's not yeah. a one way up street you know so um you know and I, I what I realized is that you can be doing really well and everything can be getting better and better and then suddenly you hit a wall and you know and you think oh well, you know why is it suddenly so hard and you know that is 
part of the process. You know, we talked mm -hmm. earlier about, about dopamine and, you know, it takes your brain a long time to, to readjust to, to, you know, the lack of dopamine when you strip the alcohol out of, out of your life. And, you know, it sort of swings, your brain swings from one extreme to, to the other. And exactly. that sort of, you know, that, that makes the whole process feel very up and down. Um, and when you know that that's perfectly normal and that, you know, there, you will get through that, it's much easier to deal with. Yeah. Normalizing that whole roller coaster process is so important. And I love how you brought up the Susan Jeffers thing right away, the feel the fear and do it anyway. Like that, that's a, it's almost a, a guidepost that you're on the right track. Mm, when, yeah. Um, I was on a panel with a bunch of neuroscientists and they were talking about the default mode network, how your brain establishes patterns of thoughts and behaviors. And that when we're trying to break out of the default mode network by changing our behavior, what ends up coming up is those subconscious fears, like your fears come up and it's the subconscious mind's way of trying to keep you in sort of that comfort zone. It's like, we have a thermostat. We don't get too high. We don't get too low. We live mm -hmm. in this sort of comfort zone. And we, when we try to break out of it or change our default mode network, what comes up is fear. And mm. so it's so good that you brought up this idea that if we learn to mitigate our fears, then we really have, we really have tools that can help get us past those sticking points. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's the, the learning to deal with, with those, those fears sort of just then opens up all sorts of possibilities for you, you know? So if you, you know, if you avoid fear, you avoid growth. Exactly. Exactly. I want to ask you about your new book, because I would imagine that was like having, I mean, that was maybe a, a, a stretch goal or maybe something you had always wanted to do, but I am so, I am loving this book so much. I cannot wait to, to finish it. Um, where did the idea of the book come from? Um, oh, I'm so glad you're enjoying it. Um, it's, it's so good. You know, it was Actually, it was inspired by all the things we've been talking about. So, you know, so six years ago, before I quit drinking, my life from the outside looked looked perfect. You know, if you looked at my social media feeds, it was all, you know, all happy. It's the highlight and, reel. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was all, all looked fine. And of course, it wasn't fine at all. It was all falling to bits. Um, and I realized that when I started telling the truth about my life, which I did in my blog, um, everything started to transform and it made it created all these connections and you know miraculous things started to happen so I thought well what would happen if other people were really authentic about what was going on in their lives and that's what led to to the the book the authenticity project which is you know the story of, of an old man who uh, an artist who is very lonely and he writes uh, you know the truth about his life about how lonely he is in a little notebook a green notebook which he writes um, the authenticity project on the front and he leaves it in a cafe um, and it's found by the cafe owner who uh, reads his story and decides to try and track him down and make his life better and she also tells the truth about her life and leaves the book in a wine bar over the road where it's found by Hazard, our, um, our addict. And uh, Hazard um, reads her story and then writes his own truth. And this book is passed between six people and they all end up meeting each other and changing each other's lives in, in miraculous ways. So, uh, so yes, yeah, so it was very much inspired by my own experience, really. Oh, that's amazing. At first, I, I was I, when I first started listening to it, I was trying to do too many things at once. I was only half hearing it. And I was like, wait a minute, I don't get what's happening. So I started over and then I was like, oh my God, that's brilliant because it starts off with like one person story. Like the chapters are just the names of the people that in the sequence that they get involved. And so I was like, oh my gosh, that is such a unique way of you know, structuring a book and the stories, the way they're intertwining already. Oh my God, I can't wait to finish. It. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I haven't met Alice and Riley yet, so I can't wait to um, make some progress. Well, Alice is, is actually a bit of a social media addict. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, different sort of addiction. 
Oh, okay. Well, listen, as we were talking before, all addiction serves the same purpose of distracting mm. us from the present moment, from our pain. It's a negative coping skill. So I'm glad you got all the, you're touching on different things. So listen, I heard that you are now a New York Times bestselling author for the Authenticity Project. Tell me how you got the news. I know. How crazy is that? <laughs> Congratulations. I mean, that is like, that's like the Oscar, right? <laughs> you yeah, win. I mean, it's, yeah I, I still, I still can't quite believe it. I mean, I was, I was actually in, um, I was in Scotland for Christmas and um, I was with this sort of family up in Scotland and um, it was about um 10 30 at night so I was going to bed because as I said to you earlier these days I go to bed pretty <laughs> right, early and I get up very early so so I was you know I was in my pajamas and I was about to go to bed and the phone rang and I thought who's calling me at 10 30 you know it's a ridiculous time to call <laughs> and I looked at my the phone of the the night. Number. <laughs> and I thought oh well that sort of explained the sort of you know the time because of course it's only 5 30 p.m new york time um and uh and I thought that's strange you know the only the only person I knew in New York who might be calling me was my publisher so I I answered the phone and it was it was my um my publisher uh Pam Dorman who works uh um who's the most phenomenal um uh publisher at uh, Penguin uh Pam Dorman books and uh and she uh she said uh she said hi you're a new york times best-selling author and yeah i'll never forget that moment <laughs> oh my gosh was it surreal were you like are you sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and I, I was on the list for three weeks um so uh, uh, so yeah so that was that was uh, that was quite something and um yeah i mean it's just i think what's what's really great about that book is you know whilst I wouldn't want to publish a book right in the middle of a global pandemic um what the the on the upside I've had so many messages from people saying that actually you know at times like this fiction is such a tonic because you mm -hmm. know like alcohol used to for me you know what fiction does is it takes you out of your head it takes you to a different place it takes you to a different world and you know, my um, my book is is always described as feel good fiction. You know, it's that sort of you know the sort of story that you read. You know, it touches on really difficult topics, but it makes you smile. You know, you come away from it. You know, people tell me it's it's like having a, a warm hug, and I think we all miss hugs right oh, now. So yeah. So yeah. So I think that's why it's done well. Is is because it's just you know it's I think it's it's helped people at a difficult time. Yeah, no, it's, and it's really, it's so beautifully written. Um, how has, or has the title New York Times bestseller, has that changed your life in, in either subtle ways or dramatic ways? Um, oh, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the great thing about, about that title is nobody can ever take it away from you. You know, it's sort yes. of, you know, it's like a bar that you sort of, so I, I think you know I mean it will always be helpful in in the future whatever I want to do but I think also things like that come with a downside in that you know I sort of you know, I I think like many women I've always suffered from imposter syndrome you know mm. I always feel like I'm not as good as people think I am and that one day I'm going to be found out <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. so, sure yeah so you know in a, in a way I, I find it hard because I'm now sort of writing the next book and you know I worry that the next one isn't going to do as well I worry that that you know that now everyone is going to realize that I really can't write at all and it was all just a big <laughs> fluke so <laughs> oh poor baby <laughs> I mean <laughs> It seems but like that won't happen. <laughs> no, no, no. I think if anything, it's it's validation that yes, my gifts are valuable. I do have a talent. I do have something to say, and I do affect people in a positive way, right? Which is so needed. We so need to be affected in a positive way, and you really have mm. that talent and ability. And geez, if if uh, getting the title New York Times bestseller doesn't smash the imposter syndrome. I mean, what would? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I think, 
yeah I, I i i don't think it's i don't think it's unusual i think it's uh, no, and i think particularly for, for women and i really you know it's something i have to fight a fight against the whole time is is you know is that feeling that so sort of, you know it's uh, i don't deserve things um you know we do oh, we do sure. deserve it yeah, I think I think receiving as women, receiving is very difficult. We're we're taught to be nice girls, we're taught to be givers, we're taught to put our needs aside, so to stand in our truth and really just own the facts, right? Own that we do mm. there are we have assets that are are valued by others, right? Receiving is is a tricky thing, but yeah, um, I think you're right. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Well, listen, I, I don't want to dominate your whole evening. It's, it's getting late there for you, but I just want to say thank you for your courage and your transparency in your writing. And I absolutely am enjoying your new book. Um, I'll leave links for all your books and all your works in the show notes. So people can check it out oh, if they're you. not familiar. It's, it's just brilliant. It's so heartwarming. And who doesn't need a warm hug these days? <laughs> oh, quite. Can't wait to have those again. <laughs> Something right. other than my husband, who much as I love kids, him, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. Amen to I've that. Seen an well, awful lot of him recently. <laughs> I know. Well, ne- next we we plan to travel across the pond at some point, so I'll be knocking on your door asking for that hug pretty soon. <laughs> Great. It's all yours. <laughs> thank you so oh, much, thank Claire. Thank you so much. I, I really, really appreciate enjoyed it. chatting. Thank you. Me too. Thank you so much. Have a great day and you bye